we'll take your questions. And um, the first piece of news, boys, is that the training wheels are off. That last year when we did these shows, we had Steve, our token millennial, to guide us through the electronic marvel that is this Facebook Live thing that we're doing. And this year, the powers that be at SNY have decided to trust us, the 60 plus contingent, to actually function on our own. So I don't know if we're quite ready for this, but we're, we're at least giving it a shot. I, I think that they've been, they've been the, powers, listening. the powers to be trust you, Gary, not Ronnie and I. <laughs> and maybe I, just, little, I just maybe a tad misplaced. Let me just tell you. <laughs> I, I just think uh, they've been listening to us for 15 years and they trust us alone in any hour window. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a rather phenomenal reach on their part, but we'll see whether we can do this without completely embarrassing ourselves or them over the next half hour or so. So if you have questions for us, um, go to the comments section on Twitter or YouTube or Facebook or wherever you're watching this and we'll get some of your questions in later. Um, so we're about a month uh, from spring training, about five weeks from the first exhibition game. And the news came down yesterday that um, the guy, I guess you would have considered to be the prime Mets target during the off season, when the off season began, George Springer signed with the Blue Jays, six years, $150 million. Um, the reports are that the Mets were not willing to go that high in terms of uh, average annual value that they would have gone to six years for a 31 year old center fielder, which is interesting. Um, so where does that leave us? What do you guys think about what the current state of center field is for the Mets? Is it going to be Brandon Nimmo the majority of the time? Do they go outside and look for somebody else, a Jackie Bradley or somebody else? Um, how do you think that gets handled at this point? You go first, Ron. Uh, well, I, I really think that uh, if not for the acquisition of Lindor, and how special is that, um, I think George Springer would be the center fielder for the New York Mets. He would have been uh, their prized acquisition this winter. But once you acquired Lindor, and that put them, I think, in a position where they could only offer uh, Springer a certain amount. Uh, the Blue Jays topped that. And congratulations to George for being a Blue Jay. That being said, I think the place to move forward from this, I've heard a lot about Jackie Bradley Jr. He's going to uh, uh, make a few dollars himself. I, I, I think that the Mets will really probably pivot uh, to someone a little cheaper, someone very good defensively. Um, because at some point, you're going to have to extend Lindor. You're going to have to pay Conforto if you can. And uh, those dollars right there bring you up to a pretty high level. So to, uh, to add anyone of any significance who makes uh, $10 million or more as a, a center fielder, I just don't think financially works within the uh, luxury tax, uh, whatever you want to call it. Well, my feeling is that when, you know, I think we're getting back to basics. I think the Mets, you, the old adage in baseball, you got to be strong up the middle to win. That means catcher, your middle infielders, and your center fielder. Well, they're very pleased with McCann behind the plate. He handles pitchers well, throws well, good defensive catcher. You've got Lindor, who's a golden glo a gold glove now. It strengthens the middle defense. Uh now you've got this what center field position. I think when you've got Lindor and you've got Conforto, I think those are guys are, are with the future. Lindor, I think probably won out because he's 27. You're getting him in his prime years. And whereas Springer, as you said, Ron, is 31 and he'll be playing with five years into 36. You just don't know what happens with injuries as players get older. And I think they'll get a, a, a cheaper guy. And plus, look at our lineup. Our lineup is strong enough as it is, and I really feel that there will be a DH this year. Whether this season starts on time or starts a little bit later, uh, I, I have a feeling there's going to be a DH, and we obviously know the Mets are going to be really pushing for that. So, um, you know, that enables them to move Nemo into left field, and then you can carry a bat 
that is just maybe just a, a center fielder that is a just a glove out there to, to provide good solid defense. So you guys raise a number of outstanding issues surrounding this, and I, I'm going to go over a couple of them, and I, I'd like to, to hear your response to whichever ones you want to look at. Number one, George Springer is a 31-year-old center fielder who got a six-year contract. The likelihood is that within a couple of years, he's going to have to move to a corner. That was always part of the conversation. So the question is, would you have given him six years if you were the Mets, knowing that at some point you complicate your corner outfield um, situation. Um, number two, there's this assumption that the Mets are going to stay under the competitive balance tax limit, which is about $210 million. Um, Andy McCullough actually did a great story on this just today in The Athletic about the fact that that, that competitive balance tax limit acts as a de facto salary cap but it doesn't have to be the Mets have the resources now to go above that so I guess the question is especially in the first year of the 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 new regime would that be something that they would even entertain then I go to the the other question of if you're going to not go after Jackie Bradley Jr and I agree with that because the other thing about Jackie is that he's a left-hand hitter and the Mets are overly left-handed who are some of the other options? I, I, I heard today the name Albert Almora come up, and he's a really good defensive center fielder. But the guy who would intrigue me the most is Kike Hernandez, because Kike not only is an above average center fielder, but he can play everywhere. And that just increases your flexibility, particularly if the DH is not in effect this year. It gives you so many other ways to go in terms of moving people around. So Ronnie, why don't you take whichever piece of that you want? Um, well, I'll go first, Gary. I, 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 lo I love the points that you brought up. Uh, I think that every team is trying to work under, it doesn't matter how much money they have, try to want, work under that salary cap luxury tax. So I think the Mets will not be any different. Um, I, I still think that George Springer, to me, this is my opinion, I don't think he is an above average center fielder to begin with at 31 years old. I think he's a very average, maybe slightly above average center fielder that uh, along with you, he'll be a, a corner outfielder in two to three years. Uh, the other name I wanted to throw out only because our esteemed producers from there, I thought maybe a trade with the Cardinals for Harrison Bader. There's a guy that I think has a, a better upside as a, as a, uh, as a hitter, he hasn't done much as a hitter uh, and is an outstanding center fielder. He's a New York kid. That might be a fun thing. And uh, I agree with Keith, you know, with the lineup's strength, you might be able to afford to carry a guy that's defense first. Um, hopefully th th those things will happen. Um, and again, like you said, Gary, I think they need a right-handed bat. Uh, I think that's important uh, in that lineup. Also, too, we got to take into account, you also read that uh, from Sandy, as well as uh, Steve Cohn, is that they want to rebuild the farm system, too. So if you make in a trade uh, for a baiter, you're going to have to give up maybe some you, you, some talent. I mean, they, they absolutely stole, to me, Carrasco and Lindor. And uh, I like the trade they made uh, for Lucchese. Uh, I think he brings depth, a left-hand pitcher with the funky motion. He's a two-year veteran. He was 10 and 10 one year, didn't pitch much last year, didn't have a good year, but I think he's got upside and provides depth. So you've got to factor in that I feel that Steve Cohen, and who is the boss and has a lot to say, but leaves it to Sandy, um, it, I want to win now, he said, between the next three and five years but also we want to build foundationally, which is the minor leagues. So, you know, I don't think you'd have to give up a lot for Bader. Um, I think, Yorani, you're absolutely right, but we need to have a right-hand hitter. And if there's a DH, uh, this lineup is potent. It was powerful last year. And now you've added Lindor. Uh, so I'm perfectly satisfied uh, with this lineup and just getting a right-handed defense specialist for, for sure. 
So if you go back to what Ronnie said, that in all probability, the Mets, like everybody else, will try to stay under the competitive balance tax limit. Part of the rationale for not signing Springer at the number that the Blue Jays did was because you have a couple of guys who are going to command um, some major dollars in extensions if the Mets do them. So let's talk about the, the, the two position players who are free agents at the end of 2021, Francisco Lindor, who will probably be the highest ticket item, and Michael Conforto, who has Scott Boris as his agent, and that's always sort of an impediment to a pre-free agent deal being made, although with the parameters of, you know, the financial situation in baseball being what they are, I don't know whether that changes. So who do you prioritize? How important is each guy in terms of, making sure that you get a deal done and do you try to do that now before spring training or at least before the season starts to uh to get them locked up long term well i feel this i i'm sorry ron they didn't sign springer i think lindor and conforto are the priority i think that uh i mean i i i don't know what's going on steve Cohn has the purse strings for me, if I'm the owner right now, I prioritize both of them. I try to get both of them signed. That's why I think they didn't go for Springer. Uh, you said, Gary, you got Scott Boris, who loves to take his clients uh, to, to uh, free agency. But if you offer Conforto, who's very much like Lindor coming into his prime, having probably one of his best seasons, even though it was a 60-game season, kind of got back to going the other way, still had the power, hit for the average as well. Mm -hmm. uh, he's going to command, uh, if you, you dangle six figures in front of him, I think Scott Boris is going to have a hard time saying no to that. Yeah, I, I feel, uh, I, you're correct, Keith. Um, these are different times. So uh, I, I know Scott's smart enough to understand these different times. Um, I think the trade uh, and the splash of the trade and the magnificence of the trade for Lindor means nothing if you don't extend him. Uh, for the Dodgers, uh, extending bets was a big part of their season. Um, you know, his leadership bets and what he came to camp with and all of that uh, necessitated that big deal and uh, paid off in its first season. I, I hope to see a replica of that for the Mets, but the trade means nothing if you can't get Lindor here for whatever number of years you're going to get him for. So let um, me, so let me yeah. ask you, I, sorry, I don't mean to inter interrupt, no. Ryan. Finish, finish your thought. No, I was just going to say for Conforto, it's really more in his lap, right? Mm -hmm. um, like if Conforto, uh, like most players, every player is like this, but if Conforto wants to go out there and say, okay, I don't care what team I'm with. I'm going to go for the bottom line is that get as many dollars as I can. That's definitely a way to go. Uh, but if he's happy in New York, they have a lot of success this year. Maybe that necessitates him signing a deal with New York. I'd love to see it. I think, you know, being a homegrown player, it's, you love to keep those guys. And I think we, we'd all love to see both of them get signed. But let me ask you this as, as ex-players, because and maybe this is a sensitive thing to talk about. But you've got a guy like Lindor who comes from a different organization who is, you know, a, a superstar caliber player. He's top of top of the, the line. And then you have a guy like Conforto, who's a homegrown guy and has established himself over the years as a really solid player, but maybe not at the same level as Lindor. But he's been an integral part of the franchise for, for six years. So Lindor is obviously going to get more years and more money. So as a competitive person, and I don't know how this works, you know, in clubhouses among teams, if you're Michael Conforto, do you almost feel as though, I don't know, as, as these negotiations go on at the same time that you are risking getting dwarfed by what Lindor is likely to get if indeed he signs the deal? Is that something that, that, that players think about? Ronnie, I don't think so. I yeah. think that you can say, no, I want more. And okay, fine. We're going to go this year with my salary for one year, and I'm going to go to the free agent market. Now, it's always in free agency. 
I mean, if you, and I said six figures, I'm talking when back in the Eight. 1980s, nine, you mean figures. nine figures. <laughs> nine, excuse me. <laughs> I was a little off there. Uh, <laughs> we'd be getting them cheap. Uh, but you never know that you could go out and break a leg, have a knee injury. And that's the risk. That's the, that's, that's the risk the player takes. For me, if they're running a hundred million dollars plus at me, $120 million for six years. I mean, send me the limo. I'll be right there with the bank pen to sign. You know, Gary, I, I think, and, and Keith, I think if you're a player like Michael Conforto that's done so much, you also have to be able to understand that Lindor is one of the 10 best players in the game. Conforto's had many good years, and he's an outstanding offensive player that brings above average defensive skills. But Lindor is one of the superstars of the game. And, uh, and he has to be signed to legit legitimize the trade. Just like in Keith in 1983, if he doesn't sign with the ball club to play in 1984 and beyond, uh, that trade meant nothing in 83. So Keith mentioned uh, picking up Joey Lucchese for a little depth in the starting pitching, but I want to stay on the topic of contract extensions right now and turn toward the yeah. pitching staff because you got two guys on this staff, neither one of whom threw a pitch in 2020, both of whom become free agents at the end of 2021, talking about Marcus Stroman and Noah Syndergaard. Would it be worthwhile for the club and or for the players involved to talk about extensions now, it gives the club a chance to get them at a relatively low price. It gives the players a chance to get a little security at a time when there's a little uncertainty. Noah's not going to be back from Tommy John surgery until sometime during the year. Stroman, as we said, didn't pitch last year because he opted out. Do you think any of that makes sense from either party's standpoint in terms of trying to do something before the season? Go ahead, Ron. Well, I think, Gary, that if you look at what's happening to the Chicago Cubs and the Houston Astros, we're seeing that the window of excellence can close very, very quickly if you're not able to tie up some of your better players, uh, where, um, well, Brantley is not really a Houston, but uh, we're talking about Correa next year. Uh, we're talking about Verlander and Granke are free agents. And, of course, this year Springer was a free agent. We're talking about the Cubs have already gotten rid of a lot of those players that were a big part of 2016 and are thinking of trading uh, Bryant at third base. And what I mean by that is, I guess, if you can identify that Stroman and Syndergaard are a big part of your rotation moving forward, or you think they are, and you feel like they're healthy, boy, I think it would be a great time to go and try to tie them up to a three or five-year deal that you know, the, the, the pitchers now, once they go to free agency, are getting, you know, $20 million. And these guys, neither of them has hit the big time yet as far as a contract. And I, I, would, I think it would be at least worth calling them both in, uh, teaming them up as a pair, and kind of offering them both a not similar deal, whatever deal uh, would be constituted under what they've done in their careers. But I think it would be a great time because then, then, then you have a chance of, I think, sustained success in knowing that you have a DeGrom, a Carrasco, and a Syndergaard and Stroman, not only for this year, but for years beyond. Well, my feeling is I don't, you know, how, how deep are the pockets of Steve Cohn? And I know they're very deep and he wants to win. I mean, that's pretty plain. Met fans have got to be very thrilled about all the moves that they have made to improve this ball club. I mean, they've, he's made a big statement that he's a player on the major league scene now, and he wants to bring a, 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 a winner, but he also stated this. He wants to make New York and not Yankee stadium. City Field, a destination spot for players that want to come and play there. And that's what it was. Who wanted to play in the 80s 
uh, when the, or the late seventies and the early eighties, when the Mets were horrible at Shea Stadium, no one wanted to go, but it became a destination where everybody wanted to go. So to me, Stroman, who opted out last year, which was certainly his right, he really kind of fell into with that offer. They, they, he took the offer from the ownership of 19 well, million, who would say yeah. no to that. He kind of fell into that because it was a necessity of this ball club. Um, uh, to, to get another starter because the, the, the depth of the starting pitching of the Mets was not there with Syndergaard gone. Now, you take a chance on Syndergaard going forward. Uh, Syndergaard is a little bit of a loose cannon, but I feel that Syndergaard, this team, this team is prepared to win and be competitive this year and give, I think, uh, bar injury going to be right there with Atlanta and it's going to be fun. I think it's really going to be fun. And the other teams too are not, I'm not discounting them. So if this team gets into the post season, I think Syndergaard loves New York. I think he'll want to stay. So, you know, those are the mm -hmm. things you got to weigh. And that's part of the gambling part of the game. You know, Syndergaard can say, Hey, you didn't, a lot of players will, you know, get upset. You didn't offer me a, an extension. So the hell with you, I'm going to go to free agency. You know, they get their backup. So you just don't know. I think knowing the situations of the two of them, what my guess would be if the Mets were to approach either or both of them, I think Stroman is the kind of guy who's going to bet on himself, right? That he's going to yeah. bet he's going to have a huge year and go to free agency and, and see what happens. Syndergaard's in a little different position. He's not going to pitch till the middle of the season. It might take a little while for him to ramp up and get back to some, you know, semblance of, of, who he was before he went down. So maybe he's in a more tenuous position in terms of having all of 2021 to prove himself. And maybe it's more worth his while to, uh, to take the, the sure dollars up front. I don't know that that's, that's just a guess based on their relative situations. I don't know. I think Steve said they want to win three world championships in the next five years. They should go to him and say, Hey, listen, if you want to win championships three in the next five years, I want to be here for the next five years. What will it take? <laughs> yeah, sounds good to I, I tell you one thing, Gary and, and Ron, I think you'll agree. I mean, you've got two ground ball pitchers, serious ground ball pitchers and David Peterson, and we don't know what's going, how he's going to perform. I thought he was like the closest thing to Tommy John that I've seen with that big sweeping slider that Tommy had and a good hard sinker to get the ground ball. And Stroman, of course, is a ground ball pitcher. And that's why I think Lindor, I think, was always the prize that they wanted because that gave him the gold glove defense up the mm -hmm. middle. You've got to have a solid defense uh, on the infield if you've got ground ball pitchers. So, um, so you've got DeGrom and Carrasco and Stroman all set at the top three of rotation. Peterson certainly looks like he has the leg up at four. Going to spring training, Ronnie. Who has the leg up between Steven Matz and Joey Lucchese for that fifth spot of the rotation? Mm. Uh, I, I want to say Joey Lucchese. Um, I think Steven has been given ample time to show what he can do. I think uh, also it might light a fire under Steven. Uh, if they go in and Lucchese's getting a little more time than he's getting. Um, I think Lucchese will be new, of course, uh, relatively new uh, to um, the NL East. And what are we playing, the AL East again next year, I guess? Um, uh, oh, we I'm not sure. To, we were supposed to play the West uh, in the original 2020 schedule. So I would think it would be yeah. to that, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, it depends on the uh, the pandemic schedule, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh I don't know. I, I would go in and, and uh, listen, the, the only trade for a guy, if people in the organization feel very good about him. Um, I'm a big believer. I always have been in versatility within a rotation and within a, a bullpen. And he certainly brings a uh, versatility. I mean, at some point I've got to explain a churve this year. <laughs> so that'll be fun to do. Um, but also, um, Hey, listen, Steven's going to have a fire lit under him anyway. This is his, baseball mortality really right this year to see what he can do but um i i think because steven's coming off uh, you can look at the numbers an historically bad year i know it was only 
60 games. Um, but, but to me, he's got to show me something uh, for me to restore my faith in, in him as a, as a starting pitcher. And we haven't addressed the left-handed uh, pitchers in our bullpen. We, you know, we've, we've got to address that. Justin Wilson made $5 million last year. I like him. Will he still be available? We got Tarpley that's coming in who hasn't. It's kind of a service, of, you know, a, a journeyman. But I still feel that's a, an issue that has to be addressed in that bullpen, Gary. Well, there's still talk about Brad Hand. He's out there, and the Mets apparently have interest in him, and that would certainly put that bullpen over the top and really create a, a, a monster bullpen, uh, yeah. potentially. Um I want to briefly touch on uh, Jared Porter. Um, yeah. This was obviously a very difficult week for, for Steve Cohen and Sandy Alderson. I thought they handled it as well as they could. They cut bait quickly in a situation that was completely untenable. But I thought the, the, the most telling moment of Sandy's press conference was when Hannah Kaiser asked him whether, when he did all the vetting for Jared Porter, whether he asked any women. And the answer very simply was no. And the reason is that there aren't women in a lot of um, decision-making positions around baseball. We've had a, a, a tremendous um, move forward with the hiring of Kim Ang as the um, general manager of the Marlins. And I'm, I'm just wondering um, how difficult it is at this point um, to start that pipeline going so that more women are moving into positions of, of greater importance so that we have more diversity in that aspect in the game. And so things like what happened with Jared Porter, if they don't go away, at least they happen less over time. Uh, Gary, you froze there for a second, but I, I think I got the gist of, of what you were saying. And as far as uh, women in the game, as you said, uh, just uh, uh, put a smile on my face when Kim Ang has gotten her chance in Miami. Um, and, and that's a great thing. Um, I also think, mm -hmm. and this is my opinion, I also think that we're still at a place where we don't always think of women to ask or to think about their advice because it's a male dominated um, sport. And, and what I mean by that is that uh, Porter was in Boston for a long, long time. Uh, Rachel Ferreira uh, has been in the Boston front office for an extremely long time. That's certainly someone that could have been asked um, and was not. So I, I think it's not only hiring, it's not only a mindset, but it's also a place where when there are people, women available to talk to or get advice from, that we do that, um, and and I think that that's that's part part of it too. I think Kim Ang is going to start the ball rolling. There's a lot of women that are in uh, positions of being coaches and uh, coach uh, assistant general, and I think that's going to change. But at the same time, we've got to uh, put the women that are in charge on equal ground with the men that are in charge. Well, I would agree with that, and I just feel that there should be opportunity. Uh, everybody has to work, you know, whether you're a player or in front office, you have to work when you're a player, you're in the minor leagues, you're in the, you're in the rookie league and you work your way up. And in front office, you work down in the lower classifications and you work up. And to me, it, it shouldn't just be for the sake of diversity. It's for if the person is talented and is, and as qualified, no matter what sex, they have every right to be in a position of becoming a general manager like we have now, which really broke the ceiling down there in, in Miami. All right, let's take a couple of questions from, uh, from the folks watching before we have to break. Um, Sean on Facebook wants to know whether we can look forward to seven inning double header games and automatic runners at second base again this year still up in the air um i've heard um positive things from a lot of um folks in baseball about both ideas um but we don't know for sure whether either one of those things is going to exist 
Ronnie's flaming out, Keith. Maybe you should. Ronnie, did you get the next? <laughs> <laughs> you're not supposed to. You're not supposed to. You'll be on the phone while you're driving. <laughs> no. I took up all these spots, spots in the parking lot, and um, I'm at I'm at this dog park, and every person in their car is looking at me askance because I've taken up all these spots. So I had to move the car. And you're talking to yourself, so there's yeah, that yeah, exactly. Here I am. Where were we? <laughs> uh, seven inning games and uh, extra inning uh, new rules. What I do don't you think? know. I I don't like. You know, the runner at second base in extra innings. Now, I know from the games are long and they're trying to shorten the time, and it is proven that the runner starts at second base. You don't have any 15-inning extra inning games anymore or 17-inning. But to me, that's something – it's rare and it's something special, and I don't like that one. Now, <laughs> seven innings – I'm a mixed bag on that, Gary. It's just like the game is like, it's like the cup is three quarter full or is it three quarters empty? You know, it just seems like it's all of a sudden you're in the fifth inning and it's like, oh my goodness, it's time to bring in your, your back end of your bullpen. It's hard to get a, my arms around and, and get a grip on it when I'm doing the broadcast. How about you? Uh, me, I, um, I love the seven inning games. I think, you know, double headers are just r ridiculously long at this point, the way the game is played. So I'm all for that. Um, the runner at second, I I'm okay with it, but not in the 10th inning. I would wait till the 12th inning, play two innings of straight baseball. And if the game isn't decided, then go to the runner at, the, at second and the 12th, Ronnie. Uh, I'm up for uh, five inning double header games. <laughs> And Monday and Thursdays off if they can do that. That's a that's lot like, of that's a lot of complete games, Ronnie. By the way, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? If we ever want to have have uh, you know that that drawer full of shutouts like Seaver had for for that's right days, that's that's what you got to have is five inning games. I'm all uh, for 154 <laughs> game schedule if they're going to add two extra teams in the playoffs. I'm for 154 game schedule. And are you willing to take the pay cut? Well, yeah, of course. <laughs> it's only money, Gary. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just Gary, checking, Keith, because every well, action you know, has an equal and opposite reaction. You Gary, know? we're getting up there. I've, I've got 18 <laughs> years left. I can't take it with me up there. <laughs> Is that how, how do you know that's how many years you have left? I'll be 85. I'll take it. Do you have inside information that the rest of us don't have? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take 85. Oh boy. All right. One more question. Uh, this is a Farrell, This is a fashion question. So, so get again, you can start Nick on YouTube wants to know what's your favorite Mets Jersey of all time. Oh, well, I know one thing I hated the late seventies with the pipe piping. I didn't like our road uniforms. My favorite Met jer jersey is the road uniform with the old-fashioned piping and New York. Back in the days of Matlack and Seaver, I always thought that road uniform was terrific. I loved it. I, I like the home one now, the one that's off-white, uh, pinstripes. I like that uh, uniform a lot. I'm with Keith. I like the road one, but the other one that I like, and um, it's one that only was used briefly, you know, everybody's been talking about the black uniforms and mostly they're talking yeah. about the black uniforms with Mets across the front, the home ones. But for a few years, they wore the road black ones with New York across the front. I thought those were stunning. Um, and I know there's talk mm. about bringing the black uniforms back for, um, for maybe for Friday nights at home. But it would great be great if they could wear those for Friday nights on the road because that's a great look, and I think it looks great on TV too. And you know, after all, that's what we we're all about. We're all about the the TV product because you know that's what we do. Well, boys, black shirt, been, black. Yeah, it's been uh, it's been nice getting back together. We'll be doing this uh, every week up until spring training. So uh, be sure to be back with us next Thursday at four on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. For uh, Keith and Ron, I'm Gary, Beyond the Booth Live, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> Trying to get in